Good morning. For our praise hymn this morning, we're going to stand and we're going to sing page 500, oh, excuse me, 361. We have heard the joyful sound. We're just going to sing the first verse only, page 361. reading for today comes from the book of Ephesians, the sixth chapter, the first four verses. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, that it may go well with you, and that you may enjoy long life on earth. Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, Bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. For our prayer hymn, please turn to page 564, More About Jesus. We're going to sing the first, second, and the fourth verse is standing on the fourth, page 564. <laughs> Father, we come before you today to do just that, to receive more of you, to hear your word, to 
Open our hearts to be filled with your will, to do our best, to understand the directions, to be about your business, all to show you that we love you because you loved us. Such a grand and glorious loving relationship is offered by you. Help us to share it with others so that they can feel the same joy that we do. Please be with us during this service and beyond so that we can be of service to you. In Christ's name, amen. For our communion hymn, please turn to page 230, The Old Rugged Cross. We're going to sing all four verses standing on the fourth, page 230.
Father, we come to this table and we do remember. We remember the sacrifice of your son on the cross. And Lord Jesus, we thank you for the love, for the determination to pay that price so that we might have the opportunity to accept the gracious offer of the forgiveness of our sins. We accept that you paid that price and we just ask your blessing on this loaf that represents the body that was sacrificed, that was beaten, so that we might have this opportunity. Help us, Lord, to share this with others. All these things we ask in Christ's name. Our Heavenly Father, we gather here this morning with thankful hearts and minds, thanking you for your plan of reconciliation, a plan you had from the very beginning, a plan that came to fulfillment when you sent your only Son, Jesus the Christ. We're so thankful that Jesus came and he taught he healed, but most importantly, we're thankful that he went to the cross in our place. He paid the sacrifice for our sins, and there was a resurrection and a victory over Satan and over death. We thank you, Father, for that plan and ask for your guidance each day. We ask your blessing this morning upon this cup as it reminds us of the blood that Christ so willingly poured out to cleanse us of our sins. In his name, amen. We always want to take an opportunity to count our blessings and for those who are so inclined to give back to God. We don't pass the offering plate, but they're at each door. With that in mind, I'd like to offer a prayer for the offering. Father, it's been easy to count the blessings. We thank you so much, and we know that there are so many more blessings that we haven't been able to count or we've just overlooked. We thank you for each and every one. We thank you for the opportunity to be here, to fellowship, to study, to worship, to hear your word. We ask, if you will, that you receive the gifts that we're about to give as what they are designed to represent, a token of our love for you and our desire to have your will done throughout the world. So if you would please guide us and direct us in the use of these gifts so that they can be used exactly according to your will. In Christ's name, amen. A farmer and his nine-year-old son were walking across the field. And the boy looked up to his father and he said, Dad, I think I got it figured out. He said, what, son? He said, Father's Day. He said, you know, Father's Day is just like Mother's Day, only you don't have to put as much money on the present. <laughs> and the dad looked at him and said, what present? I'm a little luckier than most because my children always seem to remember me on Father's Day. 
Father's Day is a very important day in our lives. And for all of us who are or want to be fathers, it's an extremely important note. Margaret and I had our first child when we were 36, together. That meant 18 each. And you could take everything I knew about being a father, put it on a three by five card, and you'd had a three inch margin all the way around. I knew nothing about being a father. My father was occupied with something called World War II from 1939 to 1946. So from the time I was two to the time I was nine, I only spent three and a half months with my father. That was at Fort Benning, Georgia. I was fortunate enough to live with my father for nine months when I was in the fifth grade, and I lived with him for nine months when I was in the eighth grade. And that's the only experience I ever had with my father, except on those court-ordered weekends on occasion. My father's favorite hobby was sleeping. When he would come home and have a couple of beers and find his recliner, he was in paradise. And so for a kid trying to connect, I didn't learn very much about fathering from my father. So when we had Tina, I didn't know anything. I, 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 I kind of tried to find out what a father was like by watching my three sons. Father knows best. My favorite was watching Big Ben Cartwright on Bonanza. And I thought that taught me a little bit about what it meant to be a father. You know, it wasn't my father's fault. My father's father left him before he was 10 years old. And his stepfather was harder than a rock and just almost impossible to connect. And so my father never knew what it was like to have a loving experience. Consequently, my father never said, I love you, until I was 37 years old. First time I ever heard it. I always knew he loved me, but I just never heard it. And you see, when, when we first had Tina, I didn't realize there was a manual on fatherhood. And there is. There's a fantastic manual on fatherhood, a manual that every father ought to read, memorize, and understand. It's called the B-I-B-L-E. And when you look at the Bible, there is a great deal on what it means to be a dynamic father. And I think every man in this room wants to be a good father. Nobody has a child and says, I want to misbehave. I want to be a bad dad. It doesn't happen. But I think there are probably several of us in this room or watching who had experiences something like mine in the fact they didn't really connect with a father, and so when they became one, they didn't know how to respond appropriately. It really awakened me when I didn't know how to respond as an adult. Margaret and I had an argument sometime in our first year of marriage. And I remember saying to her, look, old lady, if you don't like it, there's the door. And I realized that's what I'd heard my dad say to my stepmother so many times. I didn't know how to communicate in an argument with my wife other than what I had heard. And I made a, I made a decision right then and right there. I would never, ever respond like that again. How do you learn how to take care of a child and be a good and dynamic father? As I was preparing this message, I read a movie, movie review on a movie called Courageous. It's an older movie, I guess, 10 or 11 years old. I went home Wednesday night after Bible study, and we rented it, $3.95. And I will tell you, men, it was the best $3.95 I've ever spent. If you are a man, and you've got to watch Courageous. It's imperative. It's a story about five men and their families. Four of them are police officers. One of them is a Hispanic immigrant. And one of the police officers 
daughter, nine years old, gets hit by a drunk driver and she dies. And he realizes he has not been the father he should have been. He starts looking at the manual and starts committing himself to reading the manual and understanding the manual because he still has a teenage boy who he's not connected with. And once he reads the manual, and once he starts to understand the manual, he starts to write a commitment. And in that commitment, he makes a covenant or a resolution with God. And he talks these other four buddies into looking at it and joining him. And they all five make a commitment to rear their children in the love and the admonition of the Lord. He connects with his teenage son. Another man connects with his young son. An African-American police officer connects with a 16-year-old girl who was about to go astray. One of the police officers admits that he had had an illegitimate child in college, and because she wouldn't get an abortion, he dumped her. He goes back and he writes to her and he says, I want to be a father to my daughter. You see, they start reading the manual on fatherhood, and life starts to change. I wish I'd read that manual 65 years ago. I I glanced at it, but I didn't really study the manual on fatherhood. When Tina was born, I was concerned just about how am I going to feed her and clothe her and house her and take care of her. I was blessed by the time Joe was born and Don was born, and Kim was born, I started thinking not just about how am I going to physically take care of them, but how am I going to spiritually nurture them. Remember, I'm still struggling. I don't know how to be a good father. I'm trying, but I don't know. Scripture that Brent read in your hearing has some things that we really ought to think about. First of all, it challenges the kids, and it says, honor your father and your mother. Honor. Even when they're not always what you think they ought to be, honor your father and your mother. But then it puts the big burden on we men. For it says, I want you to control them, to teach them how to behave in the love and the admonition of the Lord. And it says, don't provoke them. And and boy, if, if I could take anything back, if I could apologize to my kids, I would say, you know, the, the worst thing I did was to ever correct them in anger. I remember one time I was driving along and Don was misbehaving in the back seat and I reached over and I slapped hard and I hit Joe. You see, the scripture tells us that we have an obligation as men. We have an obligation not just to feed them and clothe them and put a house over them and give them a car. We have an obligation to help them have a relationship with Jesus Christ. And that's an obligation if we don't adhere to. We are potentially losing those kids to hell. And it's just that simple. I spent my life worrying about how am I going to take care of them physically. Not always realizing the most important thing, most important responsibility I have as a father is to take care of them spiritually. Do not provoke your children to anger. In other words, discipline with self-control. Something I didn't always practice like I wish. Model emotional self-control. The second thing it tells us is to nourish them and nurture them and bring them up in in an understanding and a love for God. And then the third thing is it says, and warn them what will happen if they don't. 
You know, we live in an age where it is appropriate to talk about the love of God, and we don't spend a lot of time talking about the negative aspect if we don't love God. But the manual on fathershood says we better spend some time. You know, God was not hesitant to use fear as a defensive mechanism. We want to talk about love, and I do. I want to love my kids. I want to love my grandkids. I want to love your kids. But I also don't want them to make mistakes. And if, if causing them to not make mistakes by fear, I'll do it. If a three-year-old wants to put his fingers in a light socket, I'm going to make him afraid of that. If I've got a five-year-old that wants to walk out and play in that street out there, I'm going to make him afraid to play in that street. And if a child wants to disrespect their parents and deny God, I'm going to make them aware that there is a heaven and there sure as the world is a hell. Sometimes I think that we dads, and I'm as guilty as anybody, stand by because adhering to our Christian principles is not always popular. And you don't want your kids to be unpopular. So you're, you're constantly walking a tightrope. How do I maintain the integrity of my, my fatherhood and yet let my kids have the freedom that they want and need to grow up? It's hard to understand exactly how to do that. You see, as kids, we don't always know what's best for us. I had to wear these things as a first grader, and a second grader, and a third grader, and I hated them. I was the only kid in primary school that wore glasses. And I got called Gramps and Grandpa and all kinds of silly things. And I would hide them, and I would accidentally lose them. And thankfully, every person I lived with, and the multiple people I lived with, made me find them and put them back on, because they knew what was best for me. They knew I couldn't function without them. Sometimes we have to tell our kids how to dress, what to listen to, who to hang out with. Sometimes we have to make those decisions, and they're not always easy. And we won't always be loved for it. But in the long run, and you know it's going to make a difference with the life of your child. It's something you have to do. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, it says, Thou shalt teach your children about me when you sit, when you walk, when you lie down, and when you rise. And that covers just about everything. What it says is, men, we have got to model the love of Christ in everything we do. It's not always easy. And I'm not telling you I always did it. But I'm trying to do it now. Because it's never too late. I have 24 grandkids that still are looking to me as some kind of model. I have 14 great-grandkids who will look to me as some kind of an example. I still need to be reading the manual on fatherhood. Only I'm now caught on great grandpahood. You see, the book of Deuteronomy says this God's anger will be kindled against you, and he will destroy you from the face of the earth if you do not have a connection with him. That's fear. God's not afraid to use a little fear to get our attention. Proverbs 19, 18 says, discipline your child while there is hope. Do not set your heart on letting them die. I never thought about that. If I don't help my child connect with God, I am helping in their death. You know, we have a saying here that if you're born once, you'll die twice. 
And if you're born twice, you only dial once. Now, if you're born once, it means of your mother, and you'll die of the physical and the spirit. That's two. But if you're born twice, that is, of your mother and into Jesus Christ, you can only die once, and that's the death physical, and your spirit will live with God forever. We men have an, a, a challenge to share that with our children and our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren. Many regrets that we may have. I pray it's not a regret that we will have that we didn't introduce our kids to the Lord. And I want to say to all of us dads, focus your life on your wife and your family. Focus your life on your wife and your family. Sometimes I lose focus. It hurts. Your grandkids are watching you. Probably the coolest thing that's ever happened to me is when a granddaughter writes in a note how much grandma and I have modeled for her life. What more could you ask than that? And see, the wonderful thing is with all the mistakes I made, and I made a lot, kids are forgiving and understanding. You know, if I, if I just had 10 minutes with my father, I'd sure tell him how much, Dad, I know it wasn't your fault. I know your dad treated you like garbage. I know that your stepfather treated you horribly. I know all that. I know you didn't know how to be a loving father. I'd like to apologize to him because I felt like he was just blowing me off and I didn't really matter. I want you to enjoy Father's Day. But much more, I want you to enjoy every day as a godly Father's Day. I want you to go to bed at night knowing I have done the best I can to help my child connect with the Lord Jesus Christ. And what's going to make you the most proud when you, you breathe your last breath? Will it be the cars that you sold or the buildings that you built or the, the money that you made? Or Let me tell you what should be the greatest experience of your life that's knowing your children are going to walk through the gates of heaven and be with Jesus forever. If you go to your grave with that knowledge, you are the luckiest, most fortunate man in the world. Father's Day is a day of celebration, but it's also a day of understanding responsibility and opportunity. And for those of us who are older and maybe we didn't do it right the first time with our kids, maybe God's giving us a second chance with our grandkids or a third chance with our great-grandkids. I don't care how old we are. We still should be reading the manual on fatherhood. And we still should be connecting with him. We still should be writing some kind of a covenant with God. Even if it's only mental, a covenant with God saying, I will promise you, I will rear my children. I will rear my grandchildren. I will, I will guide my great-grandchildren to have a personal relationship with you, Father. And to accept your son as their Lord and Savior. A covenant that enables us to be God's ambassadors to our children. The manual is there. All we have to do is open it up, read it, and try to understand it. But you have to have desire to do it. And you have to have the courage to implement it. And I beg you, if you've never watched the movie Courageous, spend $3.95 to change your life. 
Christ has been so good to our family. My children have overcome the weaknesses of their father. And I am extremely blessed. I pray each one of you are blessed as well. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, I had the other one. As you know, we gather together, we always offer an invitation. We never know when there's someone in this room who's never seriously taken into consideration accepting Jesus as their Lord and Savior. If there's anyone here who's never done that, we invite you to come. Make that commitment. And fathers, I pray that you are silently making a new commitment today to be the best dad, the best grandpa, the best great grandpa you can be. And understanding that God has given you an opportunity to make a difference in the world, one child at a time. Our hymn invitation is number 534. 534. And if you're able, we encourage you to stand. we prepare to dismiss, let me say something that's truly from my heart, as I hope everything I've said today is. Some parents have misunderstood how to lovingly correct their children. And so it's become abuse. Because of the abuse of some, the ability to correct children in the home and schools and by the police have been greatly watered down. I find no real value in that. The only thing that's going to save our nation and the world is when we start learning how to correct our children in the love and the knowledge of the Lord. Then things will turn around. Will you join me?
Father, as we've gathered here today, we give you praise. We thank you. You've blessed this congregation and these families abundantly. We fathers thank you for giving us the opportunity and the responsibility of rearing our children and striving to lead them to a relationship with you. We pray for forgiveness when we fail, encouragement when we're doing it right. We pray for patience, and we pray for the ability to keep on keeping on. For there's nothing in this world you've given us to do so important and to love our children. We pray for forgiveness. We pray for new opportunities. We pray for blessing in Jesus' name. Amen.